If you will take your Bibles, open them with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And so in trying to decide what I was going to preach this morning and, and make available for live streaming this evening, I thought about how this past Sunday we concluded Luke 15 with reflection on especially the elder son and how much he reflected the Pharisees, the scribes who were finding fault with Jesus, eating with sinners, dining with them, trying to share the gospel with them. And one of the chief characteristics of the Pharisees is actually going to be addressed here in Matthew chapter 7. And it is one of those things where you and I, we have, unfortunately, we have such familiarity with. And I'm hoping that maybe God will just kind of um, touch our hearts afresh and anew and help us to, to not fall into the trap of what our text is about. So my title for my message this morning is Pulling Planks. Pulling planks. So at a pastor's conference many years ago in Spokane, Washington, um, Chuck Swindoll, he tells about being at this Christian center. And before the services even began on the first evening, this man comes up to him. You could tell right from the start that this man was excited to meet uh, Charles Swindoll. And he said, sir, I have so long looked forward to meeting you. I have so, since this conference was scheduled, I've looked forward to hearing you in person. I've listened to you for years. I've benefited, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm just thrilled to meet you and to hear you in person tonight. And of course, Chuck Swindoll was just, you know, humbled by that and appreciative and, you know, met, uh, introduced himself and talked with him, et cetera. Well, it came time for the service to begin. And lo and behold, I mean, Chuck Swindoll's not that far into his message and he just kind of happens to glance over there and the guy's gone to sleep on him. <laughs> and so like we preachers are prone to do, we always give the benefit of the doubt to begin with. And so he concluded that maybe there had been a lot of traveling involved in him getting to this Christian conference center. And so he thought, you know what? He's probably tired and weary. Ain't no problem. Next night, same thing. Next night, same thing. And on the last night, same thing. When the conference was over, his wife came up to him and said, Chuck, I, or, uh, Pastor Swindoll, I would like to apologize to you for my husband falling asleep. Just a few months ago, he was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And the medication he's on, he just cannot stay awake. But he so wanted to be here to hear you. Boy, isn't it so easy to draw wrong conclusions about people? Um, I'm a little bit hesitant to do what I'm about to do, but I think it'll be okay. There's a couple that have been worshiping with us for the past two Sundays. This past Sunday, I interacted with some people who noted them during the service and especially when we stood to sing. And this couple, the, the, the wife has her arm around her husband the whole time we're singing this past Sunday. And people who observed that thought to themselves, well, boy, they're really all loving on each other, even, even during a congregational worship service. Well, Jennifer and I had interacted with this same couple Sunday a week ago. And the whole time we interacted with them, he's, he's kind of he's moving back and forth, and he's kind of shaking his head some. And I, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, something something's a little off. And the next thing I know, his wife just grabs a hold of him. He had a brain hemorrhage several months ago, had surgery that spared his life. They thought he was going to die. And so his wife, boy, she was so lovingly, proudly helping hold up her husband. And so it's so easy to see something and draw wrong conclusions. It's so easy to be judgmental. And that's going to be the thrust of what we're going to be looking at here in our passage um, this morning. So I, I read this story about a guy named Andrew. Andrew, five years old. He's in kindergarten. He and his parents are visiting some neighbors. And uh, little Andrew's got one of those little pocket pictures of his kindergarten class and he pulls it out and he starts pointing out to those neighbors well this is Johnny he hits everybody 
And there's Rusty. He is mean. And he punches people on the playground. And then he points to himself, and there I am, minding my own business. <laughs> Isn't it easy to point out the faults in other people and then just view ourselves as minding our own business. So, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Matthew 7, verse 1 may actually be the most familiar verse in all the Bible in the larger culture. There's a whole lot of people that probably know something about Matthew 7, 1, who might not know John 3, 16. Matthew 7, verse 1, judge not that you be not judged. And so this kind of uh, comes out in a number of different ways in our culture. It, it, it's a way that people have of trying to just get people to abstain from having any issues with their moral conduct. I mean, we see it all the time. We see it on the news media. We see it on television. Somebody does something, and somebody maybe begins to speak about it, and they say, hey, wait a minute, don't, don't judge me. Don't you judge me. Parents concerned about their daughter, concerned about the young man that she has asked if she can go out on a date with him. And so the parents, they're just trying to do what any good godly parents would do. They're concerned about this young man. They're concerned about the people that he hangs out with, etc. And the daughter just kind of lashes out and says, don't judge my friends. She might not know with what scripture to anchor that to erroneously, but that's what she's got in mind. So I think it would help us to, to slow down for a moment and think about what it means when it says to judge not lest you be judged. And maybe it will be helpful for us initially to talk about what it does not mean. Chances are people who quote this verse the most are the ones who understand it the least. Um, a local Boston TV show featured a couple of homosexual teenagers and during the interview process, um, one of them actually professed faith in Jesus. And the person doing the interview said, well, now, uh, doesn't that cause a problem? Isn't there a conflict with that and what the Bible teaches? Oh, no, the young man said. Oh, no, God accepts me and loves me just the way I am. Other people shouldn't judge me. Well, that is not what Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 is teaching. Um, so let, let's imagine that um, you have a coworker, and the coworker is kind of skimming off some funds. Let's say he's in accounting and he is skimming off some funds and he's pocketing some, uh, some of the company's money. And on top of that, let's say he's cheating on his wife. I mean, you, you've, you've been, you, you're in a good friendship relationship with this person, and finally you, you decide to get up the, the muster and say, hey, look, you, you, you know what you're doing is not right. And can't you imagine that person say, hey, man, don't, don't you judge me. Aren't you a Christian? Doesn't the Bible say judge not lest you be judged? Don't be judging me. They misunderstand what this verse is about. So when it says judge not lest you be judged, it does not mean that we are to refrain from all criticism. Sometimes we, we need to address issues in life, situations at work, people in our family, and it might be what we could call constructive criticism. It, this scripture does not eliminate that. It doesn't mean that we refuse to discern between truth and error, between good and evil. When Jesus said judge not, he's not talking about judging open and obvious sin. Um, when you get down a few verses, later, matter of fact, verse 6. Verse 6 talks about avoid giving what is holy to dogs. Avoid giving pearls to pigs. Well, okay, that's going to require me to make some judgment calls. Who's he talking about? And if I'm going to look at somebody's life to determine whether or not they fit that category, I've got to discern. I've got to be critical in my thinking about their life. So it's not saying you shouldn't do that. You get down to verse 15, Jesus says, beware of false prophets. Well, I have to judge, if you will, what somebody is saying and teaching and instructing so if, if it's not in line with Scripture, then I'm going to beware of them. So what does judge not 
mean? In essence, it means don't be judgmental. Don't be critical. Don't be a fault finder. So I read of a wife who had this hard to please husband. It seemed as if all their married life, she couldn't do anything to please him. But maybe she'd been to church that past Sunday and she felt convicted to just keep on keeping on doing her best. So on this particular day, she decided, I am going to show devoted love to my husband all day long. And so first thing in the morning, she says, darling, what would you like for breakfast? And he kind of growls and says, I'd like... uh, I'd like toast and grits. I'd like sausage and bacon. And I'd like two eggs, one fried, one scrambled. And so she goes, she brings it to him. He looks at it and says, you scrambled the wrong egg. (laughs) Now, some of you, you might want to consult with your friend afterwards to make sure you get the little joke there. Don't be judgmental. Don't be fault finding. The Lord here in Matthew 7, 1 is condemning a proud and self-righteous spirit. That feeling of superiority. That spirit that thinks you're right all the time and everybody else is mostly wrong. Judgmental people make assumptions about others that are almost always negative. They often express themselves in a derogatory manner. Judgmental people treat other people with contempt. The judgmental person tends to be hypercritical and delights in finding fault with others. Sadly, there are people who feel like they have the gift of criticism. The gift of criticism. They feel like they're called of God to criticize other people. The only exercise they ever get is jumping to conclusions and running people down. The judgmental person rarely exercises mercy toward others, rarely shows other people grace. And so what Jesus is talking about when he says judge not is a hasty, unloving, holier-than-thou type of attitude. That's what he's saying don't do. All right. So having identified judgmentalism as the problem that we're to avoid, let let me just share three things about judgmentalism. First, the gravity of it, the gravity of judgmentalism. So notice what he goes on and says, Matthew 7, the first two verses, judge not that you be not judged for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Scripture is actually teaching a boomerang principle here. It it is saying that in part, the judgment that I'm going to face before God will be affected by my judgment of other people in the here and now. So let me see if I can maybe illustrate this to help us out. So I don't don't want to get too far off. Um, the camera screen. Let, let's just imagine that this big old pot represents the grace and the mercy that has been overflowing and just poured out on your life over and over and over again throughout your Christian experience. So Having experienced this much grace and this much mercy, how many of us maybe have a tendency to maybe measure out, what is that, a fourth? Or maybe, or maybe we use something smaller. Or maybe even something smaller or maybe is is it possible that some of us who have experienced this much grace lavishly poured out on us over and over again when it comes to showing grace and mercy to others which which one of these might best describe 
the grace and the mercy with which you show to others. Scripture says, um, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, that doesn't mean that if I take an anything goes approach and never hold anybody else accountable, then the Lord won't hold me accountable either. No, God's standard is fixed But don't you want God to take his standard of judgment in your life and apply it to you mercifully, graciously? Man, I do. I sure want to stand before the Lord one day. He's already treating me mercifully. He's already treating me graciously. And when I stand before him one day, man, I want that to be a merciful judgment. I want that to be a gracious judgment. Well, if in the here and now, yours is that little teaspoon, teaspoon, as it were. If that, well, and you're going to stand before God, do you really want him to use a teaspoon? Or do you want him to use a great big old bucket of mercy and grace? Um, so you and I partially set the bar for our own judgment. Listen, scripture elsewhere teaches in Luke chapter 6, verses 37 and 38. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, the context for those couple of verses, up in verses 34 and 35, he talks about imitating God who is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Verse 36 tells us to be merciful even as your father is merciful. And so, man, uh, when I, okay, so Jennifer and I, we are ice cream lovers. Most of you know that. We had a couple of uh, our nieces that spent a couple of nights with us. They were here specifically to visit Grandma and Granddaddy Wiggs, and they stayed in our home. And we were sharing with them our habits from yesteryear, how like 20, 25 years ago, we would get, well, I would get, you know, the Unity plastic cups that we did like our 20th anniversary, that size cups, kind of like the cup size you get at basketball games, football games. I would fill that up with ice cream. Every night, and I'm the sweet and salty kind of guy, so when I've had sweet, i got to follow it up with salty, and so we would eat ice cream and then Cheez-Its every night. We had to stop. Bad stuff was happening to our overall physical well-being. So now, I get a cup that's about a third that size, and I get Carb Smart ice cream. And you know what I do? I scoop it in there in that cup. You know what I do then? I press it down as tight as I can get it. Put another scoop and I press it down. Well, guess what? That's similar to the imagery that Jesus talked about there in Luke. Man, you be merciful. You give graciously. You give generously. You be kind and gracious to others and God will press it down and pour it out lavishly in your lap. So instead of being judgmental, instead of being fault-finding, man, be gracious with people, be generous with them, be kind toward them, be merciful toward them. Um, so Jesus' overall point, let me see here, I, I, I went too far. Um, I like the way Eugene Peterson kind of paraphrases these two verses. Don't pick on people, jump on their failures, criticize their faults, Unless, of course, you want the same treatment. The critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. So, we've seen the gravity of judgmentalism. Let's stop for a moment and consider the hypocrisy of judgmentalism. The hypocrisy of it. So, read with me there in Matthew 7, verses 3 and 4. And why do you look at the speck? And it might be 
implied the speck of dust. It's possible that Jesus is reflecting from his days growing up in his father's shop as a carpenter. And so he says, why do you look at that speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, hey, hey, come here, let me me remove that speck from your eye and look, a plank or a log is in your own eye. So Jesus' overall point here is, why in the world do you criticize other brothers and sisters or other people in general and not take care of the stuff that's on, it's in your own life. So, you got to get the big plank, this big log out of your own eye, if you want to be used of the Lord to help maybe get a legitimate little speck out of your brother's eye. So, one writer says, um, you hear another believer cursing. And I can, I can remember sometimes on the golf course, with people that were a part of our church, members of our church. I'm their pastor. They hit a bad shot. I'm thinking, what did you just say? Oh, I'm I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So imagine that in humility, you gently and lovingly correct that person in private. You don't don't embarrass them. Hey, man, look, what, what? What about that 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 cursing? I'm, I know you hit a bad shot, but come on. And then that person who lovingly, gently, privately corrected that person about his or her cussing, then turns around and gets on the phone and gossips to beat the band. Hold on a minute. Get that log out of your eye so that you might effectively help the brother or the sister get his or her speck out of their eye. Imagine a father. He is legitimately concerned about his daughter's dress. Any Christian father ought to be. Wants her to be modest, etc. And so he looks at her wardrobe. He makes her change clothes, etc., 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 etc. She goes out modestly dressed and her father has given his approval. And then no sooner has he Has she gone out the door that he sits down and on the computer is looking at inappropriate images? Come on, Dad. Get the log out of your eye before you try to get the speck out of your brother or sister or, in this case, daughter. I like what John Stott says. He says, we have a fatal tendency to exaggerate the faults of others and minimize the gravity of our own. We seem to find it impossible when comparing ourselves with others to be strictly objective and impartial. On the contrary, we have a rosy view of ourselves and a jaundiced view of others. Indeed, what we are often doing is seeing our own faults in others and judging them vicariously. That way, we experience the pleasure of self-righteousness without the pain of penitence. The gravity of judgmentalism, the hypocrisy of judgmentalism. Thirdly, the remedy for judgmentalism. Two, Two major thrusts here. Number one, admit And repent of your hypocrisy and sinful assumptions. Admit and repent of your hypocrisy and sinful assumptions. So, verse 5. First part says, hypocrite. So, you know, why, why get the log out of your own eye first, you hypocrite. First, remove the plank from your own eye. The obvious result of being judgmental and critical and finding fault is hypocrisy. I like the story that R.H. DeHaan tells. This is when he was working at a radio Bible class. And so he gets to work early that morning. And as soon as he walks in the doors into his office, he hears this kind of like semi-high-pitched noise. But he's not sure where it's coming from. So he didn't even sit his briefcase down. He goes down the hall and... He is still hearing it. He goes into other people's offices. He cannot find where it's coming from. He keeps looking and looking and looking. Finally, he gives up, goes back into his office, sits his briefcase down, pops the um, the handle things, whatever, opens it up, and there was the noise. It was one of those uh, dictation machines. And um, I think uh, it had run out, and so it had this beeping noise to let you know you needed to turn He was the problem all along. He's looking, 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 trying to find fault elsewhere. 
It was coming from his own briefcase. Kevin DeYoung says, as sinners, we are apt to assume the worst about people. We're eager to find favorable comparisons that make ourselves look good at the expense of others. We're quick to size people up and think we have them figured out. But I have learned over the years, both as the giver and receiver of judgmental assumptions, that it is best not to assume. Don't assume you know the facts after hearing one side of the story. Don't assume the person is guilty just because strong charges are made against him. Don't assume the divorced person is the blame for the divorce. Don't assume the single mom isn't following Jesus. Don't assume the church that struggles is a bad church. Don't assume that bad kids are the result of bad parents. Don't assume that the rich are ungenerous. Don't assume the poor are lazy. Don't assume everyone has forgotten you. Don't assume they meant to leave you off the list. Don't assume everyone else has a charmed, wonderful, perfect life. Don't assume that someone's repentance isn't genuine. Don't assume that someone's forgiveness isn't sincere. So the remedy of judgmentalism, admit and repent of your hypocrisy and sinful assumptions. Number two, care for and restore others with humility. Care for and restore others with humility. Latter part of verse 5. And then, after you get the log out of your own eye, after you repent of your hypocrisy, etc., then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. All right, another little demonstration for you. Every now and then we need to just go revisit children's church, right? So, when I put these sunglasses on, now, I'm thinking about wearing these on Sunday. What do y'all think? Hey, don't be judgmental. Um, (laughs) But these glasses, man, they they change. I am popping like crazy. They change my view of everything. Everything in here is different now. You know what I would like to encourage all of us to consider? is putting on glasses of grace. Just put on glasses of grace. You get the log, the plank out of your eye, and then that helps you to see differently other people. And guess what? Some of those other people, they, they, they do have an issue. And they might have something that you can help them with. The whole theme of the latter part of verse 5 reminds me of Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual. And if we were to tie these two texts together, those who were spiritual are people who put on grace-colored glasses. People who have a big... A big dispenser of grace. Those are the spiritual ones. You who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So there was this lovely little girl. She's got two big old red juicy apples in her hand. And her mom comes to her and says, Oh, hey, sweetheart, can mama have one of those apples? The little girl looks at mama, and she looks at those apples. She bit into one, and her mama's like, what is she doing? She bit into the other one, and mama's kind of like trying to figure out, why are you doing that? And then all of a sudden, the little girl said, here, mama, this is the sweeter one. Oh, Lord, would you help us to delay judgment And to be sweet toward others at all times and view them with glasses of grace. Let's pray. Father, everything I preached is a whole lot easier to preach than it is to flesh out. I have such a tendency, Lord, toward being negative, toward being critical, toward jumping to conclusions. And Lord, even for... Preparing for this morning, I have asked for your forgiveness. Lord, help me to keep glasses of grace on, as it were. Lord, help me to use 
um, big measures to pour out grace and mercy on others. And Lord, help these, my brothers and sisters, to do the same. Help us to not be judgmental, but help us to be graceful and merciful. In Jesus' name, 